Well, hey there, and welcome to episode number 519 of Six Pixels of Separation, the Miram podcast. My name is Mitch Joel. It's Sunday, June 19th, 2016. Let's get on with the show. So who are you and what do you do? My name is Jonah Berger. I'm a marketing professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania uh, and author of Invisible Influence as well as Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Dr. Berger, how are you, my friend? Good. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. No, it's great. I'm super excited. Uh, you're, you're, you're stumbling now with Invisible Influence into an area that I, I find extremely fascinating. And influence for me is 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 extremely interesting only because I think in our circle of people who like to think about marketing and business, it's like, okay, so this is really cool. But to the customer, it's like, what are you doing to my brain? <laughs> influence can be a scary word to people. I, I think uh, we tend to think about influence as a bad thing, about being influenced and being influenced as negative. But influence is often, just as often, a, a good thing rather than a, than a bad one. And the more we understand how it works, the better we can take advantage of its good parts and avoid its bad ones. So talk to me about the good. Where do you see the power of this being a force of, of positivity? Yeah. So, you know, everything from helping us make better decisions. So um, imagine for a moment you, you couldn't use online reviews or talk to anyone else before uh, figuring out what restaurant to go to or, or what book to, to buy. It'd be very effortful. And so others often provide information that help us make better choices. Uh, but also, uh, you know, we can motivate others uh, and motivate ourselves more effectively by using peers. And we can make better group decisions by using social influence. So influence is really a, a powerful tool. We just have to understand how to harness it. Okay, so let's sort of unpack this because you're in a world where your first book, Contagious, comes out. Um, as someone who knew you, I think we sort of met right before the book came out. I was able to sort of sit on the sidelines because we wound up doing speaking gigs together and stuff and watch this insanely meteoric rise of your uh, career and your and, and your content really out to more general audience beyond the academics and businesses that were engaging with you. And you have to follow up the success of Contagious. So where are you when you were like, okay, this idea of invisible influences and hidden forces, this is the area that I want to tackle next and why? You know, I, I've given uh, talks to lots of audiences about Contagious. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to share the science with people and, and help them apply it. But people would often come up to me after a talk and say, oh, Contagious is great. I love this idea of getting, getting messages to catch on or getting products to catch on. But what if I just need to influence one other person? Uh, you know, does Contagious have an answer for me there? Or, or what if I'm not even trying to influence somebody else, but I'm trying to use others to help me be better? I'm trying to motivate myself or I'm trying to hit my goals or I'm trying to make better decisions. How can I help uh, do that by using others? And I would often give them an answer, but I realized that answer had nothing to do with Contagious. It was really a completely different book. And people would sometimes ask, well, where can I read about that? Or you know, do you have any suggestions? And I would think about it. And there are obviously some great books out there on persuasion. But on this type of influence, there's, there's not so much. And so I really wrote this book to hit that, that need, to help people understand, well, how can I be more influential at the office? How can I make these better decisions? How can I motivate myself and others? And how can I use peers and the powerful tool they can be to help me live a happier and healthier life? life. Were you capturing these stories and ideas and data points prior to crystallizing it as a book or was it at the book moment where you're like, okay, now I got to keep my eyes peeled for, for how I'm going to pull this together? Uh, definitely the former. So I've you know, been teaching a course uh, at Wharton uh, now for a number of years on the science of social influence and had a day, for example, on imitation, had a day on being unique, uh, had a day on uh, differentiation. And so uh, a lot of the examples from this book came from some of the material that I'd already been teaching uh, or research that I'd already done. But it was also a nice opportunity to dig into the science further than I ever had before and look at some great examples of companies and organizations and individuals that are applying this science to some great results. So, uh, you know, everything from uh, companies that have harnessed social influence to make products or ideas popular, uh, individuals that have been able to motivate their teams, or even a power company that was able to get people to save energy by using peer influence. And so uh, a great chance to survey things that I might not have seen before and incorporate some old favorites. So you said earlier that 
invisible influence in the way in which you're discussing it, there hadn't been much written about why? What do you think was going on that it hadn't been tackled? Is it just that we have we live in a world now where I, I think behavioral economics has sort of led to this place where people are becoming more and more interested in like almost subcategories of why we do certain things? Is that what was going on? Yeah, I mean, what, what's great about uh, behavioral economics is uh, five or six years ago, people thought anything that was about human behavior was behavioral economics. Right. Uh, and, and then people said in the rest, wait, there's this whole literature on social psychology that's been around way before behavioral economics was that actually has a lot of interesting things to say. And some of those things are actually different than what uh, even behavioral economics might predict. Uh, and so it's been an exciting opportunity to, to dig into some of that stuff and share some of that science. I think to your question about what's different or, or what's new here, you know, we tend to think about a particular flavor or style of influence, which is imitation. Uh, we tend to think about, oh, you know, the neighbors all drive similar cars or the kids all dress the same and listen to the same music. And that, that's that certain flavor of social influence that does exist. But influence is not just one way or one flavor. It's, it's almost like a magnet. Uh, sometimes it attracts and leads us to do the same thing as others. But sometimes it repels and leads us to do something completely different. And so part of the book is about understanding, well, when does influence lead us to do the same thing and when does it lead us to do something different? Uh, but also how do we blend those two things? I talk about uh, an idea called optimal distinctiveness, this goal we have to be similar and different at the same time and how we balance those motivations and also how companies balance those ideas to get their products or ideas to be successful. Yeah, talk about that because it was one of my – the things that stuck out when I was reading the book is this idea that what what often works in the most efficient and effective way also works because it is a complete deterrent for everybody you're trying to not have because there are a lot of, to buy your product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll talk about optimal distinctiveness for a second, and, and then we can go into some of the other stuff as well. But um, uh, you know, there's this old notion of being different in in business. This notion that we we have to be different, and being different is almost a, a value or a gold standard in in America. You know, the notion is that uh, Steve Jobs was successful because he was different. That Apple was successful because they make different uh, products, and they even had a motto for a while that was think different. And so uh, we have this idea that different is good. But if you actually look at the data, different isn't what actually succeeds most of the time. Uh, Apple, for example, wasn't the first uh, company uh, to come up with what ended up being the iPhone. Um, you know, another company did. Uh, or you know, Apple MP3 actually, or any you know, of those. Yeah, yeah it wasn't, they weren't the first mover in those, those industries. It wasn't that they were being different. Uh, they were actually being followers of folks that were out there already. You know, Chobani, a brand that everyone now thinks and is synonymous with Greek yogurt, they weren't the free, first Greek yogurt brand in the United States. It was a brand called Faye that was around for almost a decade before they were. And so many of these things that we think are different aren't actually the first movers, they're the second or third movers. And second or third movers end up often being better off than first movers. And if you look at the data, it's not that being different makes you successful. It's being what, again, I, I describe as optimally distinct or similar or different at the same time. Hmm. It's about being different enough so that people say, I need something new. Because if you're exactly the same as what's already being offered, what's, what's the reason to buy from you or work with you? but also similar enough so that it's not so scary or different that we don't understand why we need it. You know, we can all remember the Segway was supposed to change transportation forever, but that was so different from where people were at the time that they couldn't really understand why they needed it. And so often the successful companies or organizations blend that similarity and, and difference. So take Chobani, for example. You know, they were able to say, look, um, we're going to take Greek yogurt, something people hadn't heard of before, but we'll put it in a familiar form factor. We'll put it in a single serving, which is what Americans were used to at the time, uh, container with a little bit of fruit at the bottom, which is just like what other companies had done, except it was Greek yogurt on the top rather than non-Greek yogurt on the top. And so mixing some familiar details with some new ones. And familiarity often leads to liking. So that, that's very helpful. Or TiVo, for example, when they, they came out with their uh, device, they made it look like a VCR. They didn't need to make it look like a VCR. There's no tape inside a TiVo. But they made it look like a VCR and they called it a digital video recorder because they wanted to make it seem similar enough to what was out there already so people could understand what it did and feel comfortable adopting it. And so rather than being different, it's about being similar and different at the same time. It reminds me, I was just watching um, Elon Musk speak at the Recode conference and he was they were talking about the ships and the spaceships he's going to be making to get us to Mars. And uh, one of the things 
uh, they were laughing about was the fact that some of these spaceships in the past were designs of them had had wings. And he's like, you don't need wings in space. There's no air. There's no. So, and it was like one of those things where it's like they actually designed them that way to get government approval. So people go like, I, I see and I recognize that look and it looks futuristic. Uh, and it sort of it, it takes me almost directly to that. Like in order to sell it, you have to somewhat make it look familiar in a way, but have the edge to it. I think that's exactly right. And, you know, take a discontinuous innovation or something that's really new. Often want to put a cloak around it that makes it feel familiar. Um, you know, we often want to make it feel more similar to what's out there ready so people can understand what it does. If you look on your desktop, for example, where do we throw things away? We throw them away in a trash bin or a recycle bin. There's no need to have that on our desktop, right? We don't need to click on a, uh, what looks like a floppy disk to save things. Um, but that's what we're used to, right? That's how we're used to saving things or thinking about it. And so we use this thing that make us feel familiar and similar to help get new ideas adopted. Internally here at my agency for years, we've told the creative team that our, our sort of internal mantra is noticeably new. And it's very similar to that that feeling of you want people to see, feel this is fresh and different, but it has a familiarity to it. Um, and it's funny because I think a lot about icons and that, the fact that we have these trash cans or it's a folder. And I think part of the output of this work in terms of success is that it is some form of an icon, right? It does have that recognizable component to it that makes me feel comfortable in order to really make influence scale. Certainly. And, you know, we don't want something to be exactly the same. So new is important. Noticeably new is important. But it also can't be so different that we don't understand it. And so sometimes making it feel familiar, making it feel similar to what we know already, evokes that warm glow and makes us more comfortable with it. Yeah. So so talk about the um, the mind and the, the brain component of what's happening with influence because that's also – the contentious part, right? In business, we're trying to think of things that are going to move the needle, things that are going to create awareness, things are going to create a bit of that warmth to it. And again, on the customer side, they sometimes see this as magic voodoo or you're messing with my head. Is there a balance for you in terms of the work you've seen of how how that product or service is brought to market in a way that avoids the manipulation? Or is manipulation just always a part of what we need to do to get influence? I think manipulation is a, a very negative word uh, and, and influence is often a, a negative word. It's like yeah. a bad word. Uh, we think about it that way. Um, but no one's upset if you help them find something that they would like and enjoy. Um, they're upset when you try to sell them something that they don't actually want or enjoy. Uh, and too many uh, cust- uh, organizations, I think, are product focused rather than customer focused. So they think a lot about what they're good at. You know, hey, we're really good at making widgets. So let me tell you about the new widget that we've made. And I, I can't count the number of startups that I've worked with that say, oh, we've got this really great technology. And I often ask, okay, that's really neat. But why does someone need that technology? You know, what consumer need does that satisfy? And they're often have a little bit of trouble answering that question. Um, and so we need to be more product focused, uh, sorry, more customer focused rather than product focused. We need to think about who is that customer and, and what does that customer need. And, uh, you know, rather than, uh, you know, selling what we can make, what we're good at, we need to think about making what we can sell, uh, thinking about that need and, and, and satisfying that need. And, um, you know, all of this uh, relies a lot on that underlying behavior. Uh, you know, sure, we may have a great technology that fits a need, but getting it out there requires helping people understand it. Um, and often that requires simplifying it, making it easy to understand. Understand, um, and making it feel familiar so that people can understand how it builds on what they're doing already. So is influence, is it influence versus manipulation or is influence on the spectrum of like the kinder side of that thought of manipulation or do you not think they're even on the same line? Um, manipulation is often what people think uh, when someone else is willingly trying to get them to do something they don't want to do. Influence by itself it isn't bad. It's like a tool, just like any other tool. Mm. You know, sometimes influence leads us astray. Sometimes in meetings we end up, um, you know, all following the the, the highest paid person in the room, or uh, you know, all following the person who went in front of us, and we make a bad decision because we were in a group. Uh, you know, we've all heard about disasters that have come about uh, because of groupthink. 
at the same time, influence can also lead us to live better lives because they help us, they provide a shortcut to judgment, um, and they make it easier to make important decisions. Um, you know, if we couldn't rely on others, life would be much more difficult. And so influence by itself isn't a bad thing. It's just how we use it that makes it good or bad. I also love some of the sort of simplistic explanations you give to really crystallize ideas that are super complex. And the one that really stuck out for me, Jonah, was um, – the mom, the soccer mom in minivan. It's like it. We, we hear, we think of that icon, and it's like that's exactly why most people won't buy a minivan. When in reality, the minivan van might be the best or optimal vehicle for them. And I, I was. It really took me that I. I really sort of started thinking about influence differently when I looked at that side of the equation, like how it works in the opposite way sometimes too. Yeah, and that's a, a great point. And, and I think what you're pointing out is we don't only adopt things based on what they do, we adopt them based on what they mean. So uh, as a company, you know, we often say, great, we make this really fantastic product or service. This is why people should use it. But what does it signal about someone? to use that product or service. You know, just like, for example, driving a BMW signals something different than driving a minivan or wearing, uh, I don't know, a shirt from Banana Public signals something different than wearing a shirt from Gucci. What does it signal about, uh, even in a B2B context, a company to work for with you as a supplier or in a, a B2C context, what does it signal about you as a customer to use uh, a certain product or brand? And Often we underweight that. A lot of decisions are driven not by the functional value of a product, but what it signals. Even political decisions. I was uh, recently working with an organization that wanted conservatives to adopt clean energy. Uh, and so we think about uh, wind energy, solar energy, uh, and these are things that should fit squarely in the conservative agenda, right? So they save money, something conservatives like. Uh, they reduce our reliance on oil, something that helps national security, again, something conservatives should like. Uh, they make people more independent from big government, uh, again, something conservatives should like. Yet conservatives are pretty much against clean energy. And if you ask people why, it doesn't make sense, you ask them why, uh, you know, one conservative politician said it really well. He said, you know, Al Gore supports clean energy, and if this is something that Al Gore likes, it's probably not for me. Hmm. And, and what I love about that, right, is what it says, it's not just about what clean energy is, it's about what it says about you when, you when you're doing it. You know, voting is the same way. We don't just vote for candidates based on their policies. We vote, what does it say about you to be a Hillary supporter versus a, uh, you know, a Bernie Sanders supporter versus a Trump supporter? And a, a lot of these candidates have done really well, not just by focusing on the issues, but by focusing on the symbolic identity it signals. So as, as uh, people who run companies and organizations, we need to think about the same thing. Everything from adopting a policy within an organization, you know, what does it say about you to adopt or not adopt that policy, but also a product or service? What does it say about you to adopt that product or service? And how can we think about the identity it signals and use that to help it catch on? So let, let's unpack a little bit this political one, because I, I also think that there's something happening in a world where we become so amazingly connected that we have access to more and more details. And what I'm fascinated with with the details is the fact that they're somewhat ambiguous in the sense of some of them are outright lies and false. Some of them are opinions and not news, and some of them are news and facts. And if I think about politics, my Facebook feed, your Facebook feed, uh, a Trump supporter's Facebook feed, a Bernie Sanders, whatever it might be, that we, we have access as individuals to so much more quote unquote information. Again, who knows if it's truth, opinion, or, or, or outright lies that that also creates a tremendous amount of influence. As a person who studies marketing and media as I do, as you do as well, I'm sure you're as mortified as I am when I look at the Facebook feed and we see what people are sharing, which are just outright false stories, but it does create a master level of influence. And you know, I think that the Trump factor, whatever we're gonna call that, is a huge part of the billions upon billions of impressions that are being created that create a level of influence. and. You know, I don't know what percentage, but there's a percentage of them that's just outright false. I'm going to butcher this quote, but uh, hopefully the, the idea will come through. And, and there's an old quote that says something like, you know, uh, a lie has gotten five miles away before the truth even gets its boots on or something along those lines. <laughs> uh, and, and what we forget is that information doesn't just spread based on how true it is. It spreads for a number of other reasons. You know, Trump has taken uh, a great, uh, has had a great deal of success leveraging the power of emotion uh, and leveraging anger and anxiety to get people to pass messages and ideas on. And so it's not just about, about truth. It's also about what does this message signal about me? What is this emotions does this message evoke uh, that shapes whether or not I want, I want to share it? But importantly, I, I think is what you're alluding to is, is technology can help uh, get 
get rid of these falsehoods or they can exacerbate uh, their spread. And social media has been seen as a great and powerful tool, and it certainly is, but uh, it can just as easily spread false information as spread true information. And it, and it can also lead to somewhat of uh, an echo chamber or, or a situation where people are only exposed to others that have similar beliefs to them. And as a result, they think everyone believes what they believe, which may not actually be the case. Uh, and so I think it's really important to expose ourselves, you know, particularly within organizations, but also outside organizations, to to diverse set of viewpoints. You know, when we're making a decision, uh, if I'm a boss in an organization, I don't just want to hear people that agree with me. Uh, you know, some bosses love to be right. I totally understand that sentiment. But if I'm a boss, I'd rather know the right answer rather than feel that I'm right but make the wrong decision. And so it's often important to say, well, how do I get those diverse viewpoints? You know, particularly if I'm the boss, people have a, an incentive to kiss up to me, to say they agree with what I said. How do I make sure in the, in the meeting that we don't just become an echo chamber, that we get those diverse viewpoints to be heard? And so one thing I talk about in Invisible Influence is, is the idea of a designated dissenter. You know, we've all been in those, uh, those meetings, those contexts where the boss goes first and everyone else goes along and agrees with them because they, they want to say yes to the boss. And the group just as easily goes right when it could have gone left, when it might have gone left and that was the right answer. And so you could say, okay, well, tell someone they should dissent or disagree, but that's hard. No one wants to be the only one that dissents from the group. So set up someone whose job it is to dissent. Say, look, you know, Tim, your job this meeting is to disagree with everything that we're saying uh, or for poke holes in the argument. And that's, that's your role. And you could say, okay, we get the idea of a devil's advocate. What's really powerful about setting up that designated dissenter is it's not only that one person that will disagree. Having a designated dissenter also frees everyone else up to disagree and share their unique viewpoint. Um, if everyone ends, is the group is saying A and that person says B, even if someone's sitting there and they feel C, the fact that someone else said B makes this discussion not just uh, everyone's agreeing, it makes it a matter of opinion. And if it's going to be opinions, they'll feel comfortable sharing theirs. And so that's a really powerful way as, as a leader to make sure that you get the diverse viewpoints to make good decisions. And I believe that. I'm just concerned that because of our exposure to content, however it may be given to us, and that the speed of which we're getting it and how we access it, right? I mean, Facebook is basically internet. Most of us follow the people who we know, like, and or trust. So we have very similar viewpoints. Finding those diverse viewpoints, enabling our lives where we accept and welcome or even bring in a designated dissenter, it's I mean, I think it's, it's a great idea. It makes perfect sense. But I wonder how many people, as our world evolves with so much of this information flying at us, if, if we can do that. And that was sort of the idea. Like, how do you build influence in a world now where the complexities of how we access information has become so one-sided or sided to a specific view set that typically we're all buying into because those are the people we're following? You're right. And I think as a boss or as a leader in an organization, you have an ability to shape the discussion that happens in a meeting or, or within your organization. But you're right. When we think about social media, uh, you know, the boss or the leader there is the Twitter or the Facebook or the organization that's, that's running these channels. And so you could ask, you know, if I'm sitting there and I'm Facebook, should I be encouraged to expose people not just to their viewpoints, but to a diverse set of viewpoints? Um, you know, is there an incentive for them to do that? I think the challenge, uh, you know, if you think about Facebook or Twitter as a media outlet, um, you know, part of the reason people pick a uh, Fox News or a New York Times is that that outlet agrees with their pre-existing opinion. Um, and people aren't always interested in, in exposing themselves to opinions that differ from theirs. And so part of it is the fault of, of the social media outlets, but part of it's our own fault. Um, you know, part of it is our own unwillingness to think about viewpoints that are outside of our own and, and be willing to consider a, a diverse set of perspectives on a particular issue. I want to go back to a couple of brands you mentioned. You mentioned Gucci and BMW. And again, as a marketing professional and someone who spends time like you do sort of out in the world, B2B, B2C, traveling a lot, I find it really interesting with a lot of these brands, um, you know, BMW, Mercedes. It wasn't that long ago that these were exclusive luxury, almost unattainable to anybody below the one or two percent. And suddenly you have a lot of these luxury brands out there in the world you know, Mercedes, you could buy Mercedes for 25, 30 grand in this day and age. It, how do you see influence in a world where certain brands are trying to attract bigger and larger markets because they need to grow in the crazy complex world we live in versus brands that remain exclusive or true? And how, is there a different, like, I always feel like influence wanes when you open it up too much to everybody. 
that's certainly a challenge for a, a brand like Mercedes. So as you nicely you know, outlined, there's an incentive for Mercedes to have a brand extension that's less expensive, right? There's, there's an incentive for them to offer a $30,000 or a $25,000 car. Uh, there's an incentive for them to offer a leasing rather than pay up front because it allows them to appeal to a broader client base, a broader set of consumers. That said, uh, the challenge is, well, if everyone can drive a Mercedes, is the meaning of Mercedes lost? Right? If the brand is based on the fact that it signals exclusivity, it, it signals uh, you know, high status or wealth, are wealthy people going to want to continue to buy it uh, when it's associated with a bunch of individuals uh, that may not have that signal anymore? And, and the challenge is, I think it's very interesting, is that brands don't control the signal or the meaning. You might think as a brand you do, but it's really the set of people that purchase from you, right? Uh, you know, uh, Mercedes may think of themselves as high end, but if a bunch of people are not high end buy it and drive it, it's not going to mean that anymore. Uh, you know, clean energy might have been something conservatives should support, but if lots of Democrats are doing it, it's no longer something associated with conservatives. And so I think the challenge as a brand is how do you manage the identity or the symbols uh, that are sent from your brand? Uh, and this is definitely a challenge, uh, you know, in, in the luxury good area with counterfeits. Yeah. For example, counterfeits come out, and I, I tell a great story about it in this book. You know, you might think the counterfeits are bad for brands, and in some way they are, right? They encourage uh, and let in a set of consumers that might not usually be associated with the brand, uh, which may make the folks that usually think of the brand highly want to diverge and do something else. But what's interesting is in the fashion context, it also keeps them pushing to next year's fashions. Uh, you might think that counterfeiting hurts those brands, but if I bought this year's, uh, and I don't buy uh, Gucci, but if I did buy this year's Gucci and now it's on the black market and everyone can buy this year's Gucci, now I'm forced to buy next year's Gucci because I want to distinguish myself again uh, from the pack. And so managing that meaning is, I think, one of the biggest challenges uh, that brands are faced with in a space where, where meaning matters. And you look at success stories, though, and, and some have navigated. You look at uh, brand like Toyota, for example, that is, uh, has gone uh, up market with Lexus and down market with Scion, right? They've been able to think about, well, let's use brand extensions, but let's sub-brand uh, as a way of differentiating our brands. But other brands have been less successful. I mean, Tiffany's took a big hit um, for offering a lot of lower price goods, which, which helped them in the short term, uh, but in the long term changed what the brand meant uh, and hurt them among a set of consumers. Yeah, it's also... It it's funny because there's no hard, fast rules for this. It, you you can go like brand by brand and look at ones that have done it, ones that haven't. And there's not really a, a, maybe a case study there, but there's no rules. You're right that there are no rules, but there are some right – uh, there's some better ways to think about it and right. some worse ways to think about it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, leaders always have short-term incentives, right? They want to make this year's number. They want to grow next year's number. But I think leaders that take a long-term perspective will understand that you need to manage that meaning. Uh, there's a, you know, a funny story I tell in the book uh, of, uh, of Abercrombie and Fitch. Uh, and they actually sent a letter uh, to this guy, uh, the situation, Mike, the situation Sorrentino. He's a, uh, not exactly an actor, but a reality show person who was on the Jersey Shore. Uh, and they sent him this letter. He used to dress in head-to-toe Abercrombie uh, and they sent him a letter and you might think that letter was saying, hey, great, you know, we're going to send you some more clothes. It was actually saying, hey, could you stop wearing our clothes? Right. We're actually willing to pay you to stop wearing our clothes because we're worried if you're wearing our clothes, some set of people who don't want to be associated with you may abandon the brand. And so it's not just about, you know, celebrities can be a leader for a brand and, and have positive identities. It's also celebrities can associate the brand with negative identities and cause a whole bunch of consumers to diverge and do something else. And or that is a great story of influence where that could have been 100% PR to put that seed in the public's mind, regardless of whether or not it happened. <laughs> That, that's true, but you know, there's another interesting story. Cynical Mitch, Jonah, but look, bear with me. <laughs> Cynical Mitch, and there may be manipulation. There's a similar story uh, about uh, Snooky, another character from the Jersey Shore, who uh, got a free handbag. Again, product placement is a normal tool. Uh, she got a free, I think it was a Gucci handbag. Uh, you'd say, okay, great. You know, Gucci sent her a handbag because they're hoping she'll wear the bag and more people buy Gucci. It was actually a Gucci competitor that sent her the handbag because they were thinking, look, if she's wearing it, uh, you know, other people aren't going to want to wear it anymore. And so their competitor actually sent her a free bag to encourage her to do something else. And so you're right. Some of these are good PR stories. But I think some of them are also clever ways of thinking about influence, how it works, uh, and taking advantage of that to grow a brand. So when you're thinking about the construct of invisible influence and actually your own positioning of this because you want to have this be an ownable thing for you, which I think is super smart – Influence has a lot to do, obviously, with our behavior. And when people think about behavior in a very simplistic way, it's a, a lot of it is about this nature versus nurture argument. 
where, where do you stand on that? Like, what are we talking about when it's nature versus nurture in terms of behavior for influence? That's a great debate, uh, and I, I don't know that I, if, if I could be any word in that debate, I would be proud, let alone the, the last word in that debate. Uh, but I think there have been some really powerful studies and really powerful research that speaks to this a little bit. So there have been cases, for example, where uh, individuals that live in low-income housing have been given vouchers to move to a different neighborhood. Uh, and what they find is that merely moving to a different neighborhood can have a huge set of uh, beneficial effects from you know life and job outcomes to health outcomes. Uh, and what that suggests is it's not just uh, about biology or uh, nature. Nurture plays a big role. The people around you play uh, a big role. Uh, or thinking about you know motivating individuals in, in a workplace context. You know certainly you can offer offer people more money or tell them that they should work harder. But the mere fact that they're surrounded by individuals that are working hard or less hard, uh, their peers, or comparing themselves to someone who's doing better than them by a little bit or by a lot, can have a big impact on how motivated they are. And so certainly. At our, at our core, you know, uh, nature matters some, our biology matters some, but a lot of our behavior is shaped around about who we're, we're with in our environment and, and how those people shape how we behave. You shore this up in a great saying, it's monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Indeed, and, and I think we've all heard that before. But it, it's more powerful than I, than I think we realize. You know, first of all, because monkeys do what other monkeys are doing. But if we can't see what others are doing, we can't imitate it. And too often as, as brands, you know, we don't think about that. We don't think about, well, how easy is it for a potential client to see that others are, are using my product or my service? Uh, if people can't see that I'm popular, it doesn't matter that I'm popular. They can't use that as a signal of, of what to do. If we walk by a restaurant and we can't see if it's crowded, we can't use that as a signal of whether or not it's high quality and we should go inside. And so if you're popular, it suggests really making it clear or observable that, that other people like you. But, but Jonah, it's so depressing to think that we're nothing more mostly than monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Yes and no, right? Right again. I mean, influence is, is like a magnet. It's not just monkey see, monkey do. There are other cases where monkey see, monkey do the opposite, right? So it's, right. it's not just not just that monkey do the same thing. I mean, you know, you're sitting down to dinner uh, with a bunch of friends, and someone orders the entree that you're thinking of ordering. You pick something else, uh, right? So that was a case where you didn't do the same thing as someone else. You did the exact opposite. Or there's some great research that looks at siblings, and and I love this work because many of us have older or younger siblings and we can see it in our own lives, showing that uh, people often differentiate themselves from their siblings. So if your older sibling's the smart one, you become the funny one. Or if they're the artsy one, you become the sporty one. Uh, and we actually avoid what our older siblings are doing in some sense because that niche is taken. Right? If they're really smart, we'd have to be just that much smarter to, to be the same as them. And so sure, their standards, they're, uh, they teach us things, we imitate them and we follow them, but we also differentiate ourselves from them and move away from them so we can form our unique individual selves. There are branches that, that sort of poke out of the monkey see, monkey do tree that I really like too. One of the sayings is obviously this idea of keeping up with the Joneses. Joneses and we've seen this, right, where somebody puts an in-ground pool and next thing you know, the whole neighborhood is proliferated by in-ground pools. And if you like fly over it with a plane, you can almost like literally see ground zero for the home that had the first pool or even cars. A new car comes out, a neighbor gets it. Next thing you know, the street is littered with those types of cars. I've heard insurance people tell me that you could literally type in a postal code or a zip code into their search engines and they can spit back basically what your insurance is going to be based off of the homes, cars, right in the three houses around you. So, I mean, there is also that, that keeping up with the Joneses thing when it comes to influence too, where there is like a geographic connection as well that I find super interesting. Oh, definitely. I mean, we've done research that sh looks at car buying uh, and looks at whether people buy a new car or not. Uh, and sure enough, things like price matter, things like advertising matter. Um, but in addition to those factors, if you look, uh, a big driver of whether people buy a new car is whether someone in their neighborhood has bought a new car. You see a neighbor driving around in a new car, you're more likely to buy one. What I think is even more interesting, though, is we see that in others, but we don't see it in ourselves. We say, sure, other people do that, but I would never do that. And, and part of that is because influence often happens non-consciously or below our awareness. Um, you know, we don't think we're affected. We think we bought the car because we liked the way it looked or, uh, you know, we liked its color. Yet we often buy it because someone else bought something new. And the same thing happens in organizations. Uh, you know, organizations love to think, oh, we're smarter than that. Those silly consumers, they do that. But, you know, we would never do that in the business world. But you 
look at, at fads and management practices. You know, uh, someone adopts Six Sigma, they're successful, and everyone else adopts Six Sigma because you know some successful company did it first. And so, even if it may not be that Six Sigma was the reason that company was successful, the fact that they were successful causes others to imitate them and try to achieve that success by doing the same thing. Mm. And then the other part of it that I think is probably I don't know if it's more contentious or more challenging, but peer pressure. Peer pressure is a huge factor, both in organizations, it's, it's, it's led by hierarchy, who my manager is, who my boss is, who my peers are, and even peer pressure in terms of just the customer cycle of what I'm going to buy, what I'm not going to buy. I, you know, I'm in this league, I'm buying SUVs at this level, I'm not going to go back and buy you know, a, a, a little sedan. There's a lot of peer pressure that exists in these choices too. I, look, we see it every day on Facebook as well. That's true, um, but again, we think peer pressure is negative, uh, and it doesn't have to be. Right. We can use that idea of peers to help people. So I was mentioning an, an energy company earlier, but uh, there was a great study that was done that was looking at you know what motivates people to save energy, and they tried a variety of different appeals. So they said, hey, uh, you know, uh, saving energy is good for the environment to one group of people. To another group of people, they tested, hey, uh, saving energy will save you money. To another group of people, they tested, hey, you know, saving energy will make you a good citizen. All those appeals, people love those appeals. If you ask them ahead of time, would it change their behavior? They said yes. Did it change their behavior? Not at all. The only thing that changed people's behavior was actually comparing them to their peers. So knowing that your peers are using less energy is a powerful driver to get individuals to use less energy. And what's neat about this, you know, people have no idea how much energy they use. They look at their energy bill, they have no clue whether what they're using is a lot or a little. And so peers serve as a valuable comparison standard. You know someone in your neighborhood who has a similar sized house is using less energy to you and, and, and this company O Power has made both a bunch of money but also helped the environment a lot by comparing people to others. Is that peer pressure? A little bit. But in that case, it's peer pressure in the good way. And so that's why I wrote Invisible Influence. We're not going to make uh, peers or influence disappear. But by understanding how it works, by being able to see it, we can take advantage of its upsides and avoid its, down, its downsides. We can choose our influence. We can pick when we're influenced. And we can use it to help others have better lives as well. So again, it, it, when, when, when I hear you walk through it, I'm like, this all makes perfect sense and it's crystal clear. And then you throw these interesting monkey wrenches into – into the conversation that, again, always were very illuminating for me because I think there are things that you sort of, I, I, at least I was thinking about, but I couldn't necessarily verbalize in just the systematic way of, you, of how well you wrote this book. And it's amazing. So congratulations. It blew me away. And one of them was the power of strangers because we also tend to think, well, I'm going to be best influenced by, again, those I know, like, and trust, or even people who might be a stranger, but someone who I might admire. So an influencer because I have a lot of people who follow them on, on Instagram or whatever it might be. But there's a bigger thing happening there with the power of strangers. Yeah, even merely having someone watch us <laughs> really having someone around where we're engaging in a behavior, being in the room, for example, if we're taking a test and someone else is in the room, even if we don't know them, the mere fact that someone else is present can change our behavior. It can motivate us or, depending on the situation, actually sometimes demotivate us. And so it doesn't just have to be. I think you know we're aware that we listen to our friends, but we wouldn't think that, well, that person at the office who I see once in a while could affect my behavior or you know that person I don't even know at the gym who happens to be running on the treadmill next to me could impact my behavior. But the mere fact they're on a treadmill next to me may make me run faster because it gets my competitive juices going. And so uh, even strangers can be a powerful tool to help us have better lives if we understand how to use them effectively. There's a story that I love that um, I've told many times in different ways, but it's so relevant to what you're saying. Um, I don't know if you watch comedians in cars getting coffee, but they had Will Ferrell was on with, with Jerry Seinfeld and they were talking about some new movie or whatever. And, and Seinfeld was saying, hey, do you ever go to those focus group things? And Will Ferrell's like, oh, no, 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 he's super funny. And he's like, why not? He goes, because this is how they go. And he's like sort of imitating the, the moderator. And he's like, you know, uh, so what did you like about the movie? What did you think? What do you think of Will Ferrell? And everyone's like, oh, so funny. It was great. And it was like this. Da, da, da. He goes, and then what happens, and the reason I don't go is it completely turns. And the moderator turns around and says, and so what didn't you like? And he goes, that's when the floodgates just open. Will Ferrell's an idiot. He sucks as an actor. He goes, I can't handle that. And a lot of that has to, I, I think it's really aligned with what you're saying, which is the minute you sometimes open the door, even though people don't even necessarily have something negative to say, sometimes they do just because they're joining in with that sort of power of strangers or they suddenly, or maybe they feel liberated to speak because someone else did. 
this is, I think, is, is a quite important, and, and you've experienced this, I'm sure, as well. But the question is when to take feedback and how to take feedback. Uh, and, and as an individual, you know, uh, you know, you write a book, you go on Amazon, uh, it's got 4.5 stars on average, that's great, but someone has wrote a negative review, right? The someone one or two a, stars are the yep. ones that sit with you like luggage. <laughs> and they sit with you. And the question, though, I think that's important, both for, for an author like you and myself, but also for someone in an organization, is to think about what is actually the valuable feedback. Because the negative stuff can, that one negative comment can stick with you forever, but is that the right thing that should stick with you forever? And so I think it's really important to make sure that you sift through feedback the right way. So I often uh, teach and professor at the Wharton School, have lots of evaluations. Some of them are positive, some are negative. I make sure to get the gist of those evaluations, but I don't always read all the comments. I actually have a peer, a friend of mine, who we read each other's comments. And then what we do is we summarize them to one another, both the upsides and the downsides. And the reason we do that is we make Make sure that we're reflecting not just the extreme opinions, but the main opinions. Whether those main opinions are positive or negative. So, hey, we wish you had more office hours, or hey, we wish you used more cases. If one person says that, that's one thing. If ten people say it, it's really useful. You know, if one person says something nasty, that might stick with us, but that may lead us to pay too much attention to that one nasty person and not listen to all those other slightly negative people who actually said something useful. And so I think as we structure performance feedback in organizations, we need to think about doing that the right way, making sure that people listen to the most diagnostic and valuable feedback, not just the stuff that happens to stick out in their mind, whether positive or negative. So how do you feel about anonymous feedback then? (laughs) <laughs> you know, anonymity is an interesting beast, right? It, it frees us up to be more honest, uh, but it also can free us up to be honest in a, in a bad way. Uh, when we have no repercussions uh, for what, what we're doing, we can say things that we don't actually think. Uh, and I think uh, when anonymity hurts is when people just uh, flow based on their emotion and use anonymity as a curtain to hide behind. Uh, if something happened two months ago and you're anonymously expressing it, you're probably expressing it in a pretty even-handed way. And so so anonymity can be useful, but if you're expressing it right after it happened, you might just be extremely angry, and that anger will come out, and you'll feel more emboldened to share it because you're anonymous, but that might not be actually how you truly feel. Uh, and so I think it's important to use anonymity the right way. Hmm. Yeah, that's the contentious one for me, right? Because I think you're exactly right, where sometimes it provides the most candid feedback, but sometimes it's a, it's a floodgate for the trolls, basically, for lack of a better word. Yeah, and I think if you force people, and I, I do this also interpersonally as well, you know, let's say I'm really angry with someone uh, and I'm about to shoot off a fiery email that tells them how angry I am, I save that in the drafts. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, and then what I do is I go back to it and I look at it again a day later, two days later, a week later, and I often find that I don't feel exactly the same way. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not unhappy. I may still be unhappy, but I don't feel as unhappy or as angry as I, as I once did. And so I think it's really important to not let emotion, to, to, to be honest, right, and to use anonymity to help us be honest in some cases, but to not let us get carried away with emotion and let that emotion override anything else we're, we're feeling. I apply the Bruce Lee exercise, which is I'll write it in like a text editor uh, as I writer, and then I'll literally save it. It's the same thing. I, and sometimes I'll come back to it and reread it just to say, I think it sort of satiates the fire too. But And 100% of the time, I, I light it on fire. I just, I just leave it. So Bruce Lee would write the letters and light them on fire. I just hit delete. That's my way of dealing with it. <laughs> I like that one. I might have to try it. That's Bruce Lee technique. Light it on fire. Write the letter out. Light, light it, it on, on fire. fire. Yeah. You can't do anything with it at that point. So uh, there, there's two more areas that I'm, I'm curious about. One is, um, and, and I believe so deeply in this, and I think people struggle with it radically in organizations. You lumped it in the book under this idea of could losing be a bad thing? And again, it's so contentious for people, but I know through my own crazy career and all the things I've been through that I've only learned the most when it was something that I lost. And it it doesn't happen right away. It takes often many years for me to be able to self-reflect on that moment and realize how important losing was to success. Could losing be a bad thing? (laughs) Yeah, and so we we asked this question: uh, Could losing be uh, uh, actually helpful in some cases, or, or hurtful in others? Uh, uh, in, an, in both an organizational context and uh, a more interesting context, which is professional basketball. Uh, and so we wondered, you know, could being behind uh, be a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, we've all had examples where being behind is uh, bad, but maybe it, it could be good as well. And so we actually looked at tens of thousands of NBA basketball games. Uh, we looked at the score at halftime and the score at the end of the game. 
And what we found was, not surprisingly, being ahead at halftime is a pretty good thing. Teams that are ahead at halftime overall are more likely to win. Every two points a team is ahead at halftime, it's about 6 to 8% more likely to win the game. Uh, and that's for two reasons. One, uh, the behind teams, losing teams, tend to be worse teams. And, and two, uh, it's hard to come back from, from being behind. If you're a bunch of points behind, you have further to go to catch up. But there was actually one place where losing was good, and that was losing by just a little bit. Teams that were losing by one point at halftime are actually more likely to win than teams that are ahead by one. Even though they're worse teams and they're behind, they have to score more points to do it, they're more likely to win. And the reason is that being behind is a powerful motivating force. If you're behind by just a little bit, those teams come out fired up out of halftime and they close the gap really quickly. Right? Because they're not just behind, they're so close that they can taste it. And it's not that being behind is good. Being behind by a lot is definitely bad. Right? In tennis, for example, uh, people that lose a set uh, tend to be more likely to lose uh, the rest of the match because it's a big deal. A set is a huge deal in tennis. And so in, in the workplace context, you know, we think comparing people to others can be good, and it can be. We want to compare people to others that are just ahead of them. You, know, you don't want to compare low-performing people to the highest performers because it will cause them to give up. You want to compare them to someone who's just a little bit ahead of them. Which is also why we have crazy titles, I think, too. <laughs> what do you mean, crazy titles? Like you'll, you know, in the old days, it would be like you know, you work, maybe you're a VP, then maybe you're. And now it's like you know, we have like manager, senior manager, junior manager. You know, like you sort of have all these little steps to get people, like you said, aligned with people who might be of similar skill set, versus leaving it more open. Yeah, and, and I think the titles help do that, but also as an individual, strategically pick those comparisons. Mm. Pick people. If you want to do better, if you want to hit a goal, pick someone who's doing just a little bit better than you. Don't pick someone who's doing much worse than you because you may say, I'm already ahead of them. I don't need to work harder. And don't pick someone that's way ahead of you because you may be demotivated and give up. Pick someone that's just a little bit better, and that will light the fire that causes you to perform well also. So in this group environment and in all the things you talked about, the, the one note that I, I sort of kept – jotting down as I was reading the book is and it's two words with a question mark and it was mob rules question mark like do you worry at all that when we start using these engines that it becomes a focus where the mob sometimes does rule that if leaders allow and open up and do these things that it could it could sometimes get away from them if you think about recommendation engines, I think that's a, a great uh, situation to think about this mob rules idea. So when we're picking a way to structure a recommendation engine, we can say, hey, this is the most popular. You should pick it. Or we can say something like, hey, people like you pick this. Uh, and those seem very similar, uh, but they're actually quite different. If we tell people what the most popular thing is, they're going to be more likely to pick that most popular thing. And so it will lead popular things to get more popular, and it will lead to that mob mentality where something may not be the best, but it rises to the top because a few people liked it at the beginning, and so a few more people liked it and a few more, uh, and it ended up going one way or it could just as easily go on the other. Um, I think thinking about how to structure those systems so we get new information, we get uh, new blood in the system. System. Uh, and so Amazon doesn't just say, you know, hey, this is the most popular thing, but they try to do a little bit of, oh, you bought, you know, this garden hose, you might like something else that people who bought that garden hose liked. Uh, and so I think it's not that influence, again, and I, I've said this a few times and you may disagree, which is fair, but it's not that influence is bad, right? It's not that knowing that someone else bought something like me is hurtful to me. It's if we only focus on things that lots of people have done, we can get pigeonholed in one particular space, we can end up going down a rat hole, we can end up following the mob. But in influence can be useful. Knowing someone else bought this and liked it can be helpful. And so just structuring those decisions in the right way is, is uh, important to make sure they work out well. I, I read a ton of books. You know that we've spoken about that before. And Contagious is one of those books that I just love dearly. And when I speak to other people and I, I was sort of saying, I got to check the book out, they'd often come back and go, you know, it's one of those books that I keep and it's on my desk and I read a couple of times. And then I read Invisible Influence and I thought, wow, just another one of those amazing books. You really captured something really powerful here. So I wanted to thank you for writing a great job and let people know where they can connect to all, all, all the great work you're putting out there. Oh, thank you, and, and thank you for having me again. So, uh, you know, uh, folks can find me on my website, which is just Jonah, J-O-N-A-H, Berger, B-E-R-G-E-R -E dot com. Uh, there's uh, links to the book there. There's some free resources about applying the book. Uh, if you're not sure yet but you want to learn about it, definitely download the free resources. Uh, and then you can also just find me at J1Burger on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Mitch. Appreciate it. <laughs> 